All right, so if you would please turn to the book of Ephesians. We do the, we're doing the book of Ephesians studying it verse by verse, and last time we did exactly one verse. We're going to increase the pace tremendously this week. We're going to at least double it. We say, why would you only do two verses? Well, we want to be thorough. But if I only do two or three verses, then I can put off the next verse until a week when my wife is in here. You see verse 21? Ephesians 5.21? Or no, 22, I'm sorry. If I, if I go slow this week, I can wait till that next time to have her in here for that marvelous instruction. <laughs> 20, yeah. But the last time we, we finished up in, in verse 18, and we talked about being filled with the Spirit. And we studied out, well, the question was, well, I'm saved, I'm sealed, I'm secure. How do I get filled up with God's Spirit? Where's the Holy Spirit dispenser at? You know, if I'm a court low. And we looked at the verses and we found that if you want to be filled up with God's Spirit, for us today in the dispensation of God's grace, we have to go to the book. We're not going to be sitting around in our room today and have whoosh, suddenly all of us are filled with God's Spirit in the way that people were in time past. Today we have to go to the book to get filled up with the Spirit. So moving on this week, I want to talk about music. Specifically, Church music, worship music, Christian music. I didn't know a song could get saved. Ha ha. There's really no such thing as Christian music. It, there's Christian lyrics to music. But music is music. You can sing whatever you want behind it. And these, naturally, like most things in church, these are verses people fight about in Christian circles. So let's read the verses here. Ephesians 5, 19, and I'll try not to be long-winded, as long-winded as usual, because I figure, you know, we've got a lot of musical people in here. There might be some lively discussion when I'm done talking, so I'll try to leave time for that. But he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Music, singing, worship services. Is that important at all in churches these days? It's a big deal. I have with me a book. You may have heard of this guy before, Rick Warren. Anybody ever heard that name? Now this, the book you bought that's in your library, is The Purpose Driven Life. That was for regular people. But for pastors or church leaders, he wrote another version called The Purpose Driven Church to tell us how to make our church work as a megachurch. Yeah, I'm, I'm blowing it, I know. <laughs> I'm just doing everything wrong. Young enough. <laughs> Young enough where I can correct that later. Yeah. <laughs> but we talk about is music important? And he says the style of music, this is page 280, 280. The style of music you choose to use in your services will be one of the most critical decisions you make in the life of your church. What kind of music are you going to do? It may also be the most influential factor in determining who your church reaches for Christ and whether or not your church grows. So this man who's built megachurches, I'm not saying he's building on a proper foundation, believe me. I'm not saying he's doing things right according to the revelation of the mystery. But he says music is so important it can be what you decide, does your church grow in numbers or doesn't it? By the way, do we suppose that gain is godliness? That's unwise, right? It's counting nickels, numbers, and noses. 
He says, you must match your music to the kind of people God wants your church to reach. How do you determine that? You must choose your church to, or choose your music to match the kind of people God wants your church to reach. What does that mean? How do you determine that? God, what kind of people should our church reach? 25 to 49? Isn't that the most prized demographic in advertising? People that are working with the most money? 25 to 49. I would submit to you that God wants our church to reach lost people with the gospel. No matter what kind of music they like. But moving on, he says, once you've decided the style of music you're going to use in worship, you have set the direction of your church in far more ways than you realize. It will determine the kind of people you attract, the kind of people you keep, and the kind of people you lose. So this guy says it's so important when you make a choice on music, you've set the course on what your church is going to look like, whether it's going to succeed, whether it's going to fail, who's going to be there. They say, this man says it's important. Our Bible says music is important too, but I would submit to you that as we study these verses, our Bible teaches us that music is not about building a megachurch. But people, I, I joke and they say the church of your choice, and I say the church of your terrible choice because most people have really bad criteria for choosing a church. But most, there are people who make their choice of church, just like he said, based solely on what the music service looks like. I can put up with 20 minutes from pastor whoever as long as the worship is the way I like it. It's true. It's called the praise and worship service. You're all familiar with that terminology? You're all well-churched? Okay. What's the definition of worship? Well, it's what we do for 35 minutes right before they ask for our money. Is that the definition of worship? I have... <laughs> It's 35 minutes spent singing, or sometimes you have some solo acts that go up. Those are the ones who are better than the average choir member. Certain churches, you'll have a guy who does a face-melting guitar solo for you. You ever been in one of those? How about this? Singing can be worship, but Worship is not just singing. Singing can be worship, but worship is not just singing. I have a message on our website talking all about that. What is the definition of worship? It's called, Dude, Where's My Praise and Worship Service? That's the title of it. I'm not going to belabor that, but worship... I don't know if any of you notice when we close in prayer sometimes, uh, as I pray for everyone as they leave, I, I'll pray that, Father, we know that now, as we leave this building, our worship service begins. Anybody ever hear me say that? No. That was on purpose. Pay attention next time. You'll get it. That's on purpose. Your life in Christ, every single day, everything you do, in his body, as a member of the church, the body of Christ, should be worship to our Savior. Amen. Not just the singing for a few minutes before we start our, our meetings. But, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, music, church, the style, the sound. Have you ever gone by those churches that they have their list of services? It'll have 8 a.m., Traditional. That's for the geezers. They're the ones getting up that early. They want to go in there and sing hymns. Yeah. Get to, get to McDonald's before the other geezers. All right. 
You see at the bottom of the sign where it's usually like 11.45 or 12.15 when all the young people have slept it off and they're ready to go to church now? And it has contemporary. That's where you get the rock band. But I mean, and that's, they're serving their, their people. But music and the production, the show, are extremely important to a lot of people who call themselves Christian and go to church. But I can only go by my own experience. When people talk about music that they like in church, praise and worship, I ask them to tell me why or explain what you like. And I hear answers that sound nothing like what we learn in Ephesians 5. I wrote out an example here. It's very important to me that, praise and worship be such and such. And such. I really enjoy it when I, I love how X type of music makes me feel. I don't feel Y until I hear my favorite. How many personal pronouns are we talking about? Who's the praise and worship service for? But by their description, when I keep hearing these personal pronouns over and over and over and over and over again, it's about them. It's about making me feel what I want to feel, or giving me what I like. That's kind of the wrong direction. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. <laughs> it's supposed to be about you offering to your Savior, and you've made it all about me getting what I like. Here's a case in point. Has anyone ever heard the song, Your Grace is Enough? on Christian radio? Your grace is enough. Oh, by the way, I know we have a lot of musical people in here. As far as musical ability goes, we're on a scale of one to 100. I'm at about a one, maybe one and a half. I have no musical anything. But Your Grace is Enough by Chris Tomlin, the whole chorus, Your Grace is Enough, Your Grace is Enough. That's Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So you're thinking, all right. That's the chorus. Then the verses, he does nothing in the verses but tell God what to do over and over again. <laughs> your grace is enough. I need you to do this, that, the other, the other, the other. Your grace is enough. And while you're at it, don't forget this, that, the other. What are we learning? Yeah. Me, 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 me. What a lot of people don't know, and what a lot of people don't realize either, too, when you make the ch your choice and go to the church of your choice, there are a lot of them that use that 30, 35 minutes, and they use tried and true, proven crowd manipulation te techniques to work the audience into an emotional froth where they're feeling wonderful and at peace and happy right before they reach into your wallet. Now will the ushers come forward and we'll show God how much we love him. How much do you love God? Now it's time to show him. Our giving shows God how much we love him. I have personally witnessed that in churches in this area. This is back when I wasn't going to church and my fiance was dragging me. And as soon as I heard that, I just smiled. I'm like, I don't have to come back here anymore. <laughs> Look at her, not coming back. But it's true though. It keeps the money going in. And I know I said I don't have any musical ability. I like music though. And music hits you in a way that's different than hearing somebody give a talk. 
or reading words on the page. Agreed? Music connects in a different way in your heart, in your mind, in your brain, and it, it works in a very powerful way. Right now, there's uh, advertisements on iHeartRadio. They own all the radio stations in America now. But they have an app where you can plug in, it's graduation season, you can plug in your graduation year. And they will customize a playlist of songs that were on the radio the year you graduated. Maybe not for all of you, but <laughs> I'm kidding. But because they know, they know the way music hits you. You can hear a song and you're thinking of your ex in your freshman year in high school. Or you can hear a song and you remember where you were, or a specific memory, happy, sad, or otherwise. But it, music hits you in a very special way. It's got a powerful force. The other thing music does is it helps you to memorize things. We all sing the ABCs. Why? Because the song, the melody, helps us remember. My daughter just did this memory thing where you have to memorize a timeline from the beginning of human history until present day. Talking, it goes from creations, then you're talking about, you know, Mycenaeans and Babylonians and Hittites, Canaanites, all these. And it's, it's something like 14 minutes long. But the way they were able to memorize it is in a song. Song helps memory. We'll get into that here in a minute, too. So we have music in worship. A lot of times it's used to entertain, not for its true purpose. We have people that build churches based on music. We have people that choose music based on churches. We have people that get worship completely upside down and backwards, and it's all about them. Do you think you'd ever hear, and we still have Ephesians 5, right? Talking to one of your praise and worship connoisseur friends, do you think we'd ever heard, why do you like your church's praise and worship service, friend? He would say, man, I really don't concern myself much with the style and the sound of songs. It's just really wonderful when I hear the whole congregation singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in their hearts to the Lord with the heart of giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father. Would you ever hear that out of somebody? Well, that's Ephesians 5. That's Bible, isn't it? That's the whole point of us singing songs, the heart towards the Lord with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Do you hear that on Christian radio? Thanksgiving all the time? I, I have to confess, I, this is one of those moments when you're a parent where you say, that was not my finest hour. I've got the kids behind me all whining and complaining. And you're just... All of you who have been parents, you understand there's days where you're too tired or just not mentally there where you can't deal with the cause of it. You just want to fix the symptoms. Just shut them up. I'm like, guys, just all be quiet. We're going to turn on the radio. And I turn on Christian radio, and the whining behind me stops. But the first two songs, I'm hearing nothing but whining out of Christian radio. <laughs> Oh, God, do this. Oh, Lord, save me. Ah, ah. And it got to the point where I'm like, turn it off. Kids, can you start whining again? <laughs> that was less than what I'm hearing coming out of the radio. <laughs> our songs and our worship in song should be the heart of thanksgiving. How much does our apostle tell us about thanksgiving? Over and over and over again. You were a filthy, rotten sinner headed for hell and God offered you grace and mercy and peace freely. Amen. Salvation, a gift of God from Him to us if we'll only trust His finished work. Whatever kind of day you're having, you're all right. Ted said it at the beginning. No matter what happens, 
Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. So no matter what my circumstance, I can at least be thankful my soul is saved. Maybe that needs to dribble into some music from time to time. But as we look at these music verses, they're not in a vacuum. There was a bunch of verses before, and there's verses after. We studied these in previous weeks. Look at verse 14 in Ephesians 5. Wake up. Be woke. Sorry. I know I said I wouldn't do that again. I failed. We'll strike that from the record. Awake. Wake up. Verse 15, don't be foolish. Walk in wisdom. Verse 16, redeem your precious time. Verse 17, know God's will. Verse 18, be filled with God's Spirit. The way we do that is through getting His Word in us. Then verse 19, music. What should that tell us? If you're just reading the verses in order, you know what's last on the list of songs and music in church? Pleasing your flesh. That should be last on the list. Like I said, I'm not saying it's wrong to have an emotional response to music. If we sing, we don't have anybody this week that played any instruments. So we have recorded tracks and we sing the songs that are in our hymnal. I have an emotional response when I hear some of those words because I know what they mean and I know what God's done for me. And I learn the doctrine and I remember where I once was in confusion and now I have clarity and I understand and I can see my Bible for what it is. That'll create an emotional response in you. You know what the first one will be? Thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for preserving your word for me. Thank you for saving the person who taught me to see the Bible this way. Thank you for the people who were faithful to teach others also. And now I can have the benefit of understanding what salvation is. That will get you emotional. But read, read the verse list backwards. Songs and hymns. Spiritual songs. Verse 19. Now let's go backwards. What should they be doing for us? They should be filling us with God's Spirit. They should be teaching us, verse 17, what the will of the Lord is, which will cause us, verse 16, to want to redeem the time, which will, verse 14, make us wake up, verse 13, which will help us manifest light. Do you see how that works? That should be the point and the focus of our worship in song. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. How are we doing on that with the instructions from him? The focus of singing is to attract the right crowd that you want to attract. And money. Good point. So, it seems like music has a teaching function, doesn't it? It should. It should be teaching us doctrine. Ah, oh, that's the 15 minutes when the preacher comes up. I don't pay any attention to that. I am all about the song. No, the song should be teaching us right doctrine. Helping us, well, we're backing up in verses, look at Ephesians 5.1. Should be helping us learn to be followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. That's what our songs should be teaching us. So that's a little bit of stepping back and looking at the forest. And I know people have questions. I know there's consternations. I've heard many folks say, you know, I'm glad to know grace now, but I really miss whatever about my old church or my old assembly. And it usually always goes back to something to do with music or, or that kind of thing. So that's why I want to try to leave time for us to, to talk about it. But 
So we see the verse again, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're going to do that. Make that the focus. Make that the point. No more controversy. No more fighting. We're all on the same page. Beep, beep, beep. Sorry. <laughs> that was incorrect. People still fight. There is controversy that still remains. You're doing that verse. You have banned any sounds in your church that come from musical instruments, haven't you? You don't have musical instruments making sounds in your church, do you? Well, if, we, if you do, you know you're wrong. You're out of God's will. The verse says that the only melody that can come is out of your heart. The only instrument allowed to be played in church is your vocal cords. You're all looking at me like you've never heard that before. There are about 12,000 churches of Christ in America. All but 20 of them ban musical instruments from their service. And there's a lot of smaller denominations that, that ban it. And the only, the only kind of music that can be sung is singing, congregational singing. No instruments are allowed. Yay, so now we got something to fight about. We, well, the whole focus of all of this is supposed to be about teaching us things and having our heart be directed towards God and thanksgiving and learning His Word and being filled with His Spirit. And we've taken it and turned it into a fight over whether or not you're allowed to have a guitar or not. Yay, church! I read one statement from a pastor who, who bans songs or musical instruments. It says, since we cannot be absolutely certain that God finds the use of musical instruments an appropriate form of worship. He's even hedging his bet. I can't prove that it's banned from these verses, but I can't find proof for. Then it seems quite foolish to risk his wrath by adding something, by adding the musical instruments. So he's afraid he's going to incur God's wrath if he lets somebody play the piano for a song. What are the chances that pastor understands grace? What are the chances that pastor is saved? Understands what the gospel is? Pretty close to nothing, right? Yeah. We've completely missed the point, but can I just point something out very unhumbly? Does anybody know what the definition of a psalm is? It's a song. It's a song that is written and designed to be played with musical instruments. That's what a psalm is. A song designed to be played with musical instruments. You got a lot of those in your Bible, by the way. There's a few psalms. Ten or twelve? I'll just read, I'll read the beginning of one to you. Now understand, the psalms, the psalms are God's word to Israel under the law. They have a lot of information about Israel making it through their tribulation and getting into their kingdom as well. There's tons of prophecy in the Psalms. So we can go back to the Psalms for learning spiritual doctrines. But if you're looking for doctrine for you, the church, the body of Christ, you're not going to find it in Psalms. So be careful with that. But I'll just read the beginning of Psalms 81. To the chief musician... To the chief musician upon Giddeth, a psalm of Asaph, sing aloud unto God our strength, make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob, take a psalm and bring hither <gasps> instruments. 
the pleasant harp, as opposed to the unpleasant harp. I've never heard of an unpleasant harp before. You ever hear somebody playing the harp? You just walk by and it's like, ah. You play the harp? No, Amy and the, what's that, series? Big Bang Theory. I've never seen that show. <laughs> but he says, play the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed or on Psalm Feast Day. So, pretty sure if we're singing psalms, songs designed to be played with instruments, pretty sure it's okay to have a piano. What's a hymn? Hymn is a song also. But a hymn is a song that's directed towards God. The whole point of the song is praise or uh, talking about or referencing. It's all about God. It's not about me. It's not about my flesh. A hymn is a song or ode in honor of God, a song of joy and praise to God. Well, that, we'd be about that business, wouldn't we? If we're having songs and our whole point is to teach us about God and what He's done for us and all the things we have to be thankful for, we should have a lot of hymns about that, right? We should be in the hymn business. And again, I don't fight over style of music. I know we sing what we have in our songbook is traditional hymns. That's what we've got. If somebody wanted to come in here with something that sounded different, but the lyrics were right, Let's sing that. I've even told people before, if you've got a rap, right. a rightly divided rap, teaching us about Paul, the revelation of the mystery, Christ's finished work on the cross, let's hear it. Amen. It's not about the style. It's not about the sound. It's about what is it teaching us? What is it causing us to think about our Savior? our position in Christ, what He's done for us, who we are in Him. But anyway, sorry, I digress. So the point of the direction of the song is about God. So a hymn of Israel in the Psalms would be singing about God under His law, His provision for the nation, His commandments, what they do according to covenant obedience, what God's going to do for them. That's what be the, the hymn's about in the Psalms. Our hymns would be about, we're the church of the done. There's two kinds of churches on this planet. The church of the do, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do, and keep doing until you die, or you may not get it. We're the church of the done. Christ's finished work. It's done. We trust Him. <laughs> But whatever, whatever the dispensation, whatever the context in the Bible, a hymn is towards God. Well, what is a spiritual song? Oh, I've heard those. They're on top 40, right? <laughs> All those songs are spiritual in nature. My kids, they hear a song here and there, and they said... It seems like all the songs, people only sing about love. Yeah, that's one way to talk about it. That's one way to reference it. They're not singing about love. Uh, carnal knowledge is what they're singing about. You hear top 40, it's nothing about carnality. Carnality unto carnality. There's nothing spiritual about it. You know why? A spiritual song is not about flesh. Top 40, all about flesh. A spiritual song would be about something about the soul, something about the spirit, something about God, something about holy things? How many songs in the top ten are about holy things? Zero! I can tell you right now, and I don't even know what they are. A spiritual song would be about eternal things. Things that are not corrupt. 
What about things that are true? Spiritual songs would be about truth. Look over at Philippians 4. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Here's your definition of what a spiritual song would look like. Philippians 4.8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. What's that? Oh, Philippians 4. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, sing on these things. That's what your spiritual song should look like. Sing on these things in your spiritual songs, in your praise and worship service, your song service. That's what your song should look like. You don't, you can't, don't just have to think on them, you can sing on them too. That's what spiritual song, and you know what happens when you sing on them? Later on, you're going to be thinking on them. I'm walking around the house picking up kids' junk. Nobody can turn off a light switch. Nobody can pick up after themselves. All of a sudden, a song from our hymnal comes in my head. And now, instead of thinking about what rotten kids and a rotten parent I am, <laughs> I'm thinking on things of the Lord because a song got stuck in my head. Changes your attitude. And suddenly, instead of me grumbling... Now, Thanksgiving. That's what song can do for you. Right songs with right doctrine can change you. Because they're teaching you things of God's Word. And what does God's Word do? It effectually works in people who believe it. Uh, let's go back to Ephesians. I will pick up the pace here. Ephesians 5, 19. says to the Lord, I want to ask a question here, and I'm not asking it to be disrespectful to our Lord and Savior. I'm asking it to get us to think. Singing, making melody in our hearts to the Lord, why do we sing songs to the Lord? Is God sitting up there in heavenly places and being bored? Is that why he wants us to sing to him? You remember when we were kids, it almost seemed like yeah. that's what was being taught. God needs us to sing to him. God really wants us to sing to him. Most like God's bored. I wish my Christians would sing to me. Is God a complete narcissist and he can't have a good day unless his people tell him how wonderful he is. Like I said, I'm not asking these questions to be disrespectful. I'm asking them to get us to think because a lot of people are afraid to ask themselves questions like that. Yeah. But that's a reasonable question. Why does God want me to sing to him? Why does God want me to worship him? Does he need our praise? I was taught that. Maybe not overtly, but it was definitely there. Yeah. God needs us to sing to him. He needs that relationship. Almost like a jilted spouse or something like that. That's the, the way it was presented to me as a kid. Along, here I come, and I see this verse in Acts 17. Completely changed my mind on what I think about a lot of things. Acts 17, that's um, Paul's message up in Mars Hill. And he's telling them about the unknown God. First words out of his mouth to the smartest, wisest, most erudite, elite people 
in the empire is y'all are too superstitious. Paul's manual on how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> but he says in Acts 17, 24, telling them about this God, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven on earth, um, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Verse 25, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Paul's telling the audience, God doesn't need anything from you. So then back to the question, why does he tell me to worship him? He doesn't need it. Why does he want it? Why does he tell me to do it? Here's a thought. How about... He wants your worship and your praise to be directed at something worthy of it. He wants our worship and praise and song to be directed at something worthwhile. Case in point, there are praise songs about the Cleveland Browns. Is that a worthy object of praise? I win in two years. They're not worthy of praise. <laughs> no amen. Come on. <laughs> there are praise songs about the Cavaliers. They're very likely going to be done tonight. Okay. I took my kids to a soccer game, and there are thousands of people singing a praise song about a soccer team. They need it. God doesn't. God wants our praise and worship to be directed at something worthy and fitting of it. That's why he tells us. He doesn't need it. We need him. We need to learn all these things to worship our, the rest of our lives, worship Him properly. It's not for His need, it's for ours. You don't have to turn here, but Psalm 106 says, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Praise Him because He's good. The Browns ain't. Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? You can praise him all day, and you're not going to run out of things you can praise him for. He's a worthy object. So, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs... Having your heart directed towards the Lord with a proper understanding of the grace, mercy, and peace He's offered us through Christ's finished work, information He delivered to our Apostle Paul for us, all of that is going to help you as a member of the body of Christ. And like I said, what happens? We've been studying Ephesians for a while now. You take all the things we've learned, Ephesians 1... Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, I know, Mike, that you and I have talked about. How did I spend my whole life in church and never see Ephesians 3? <laughs> Why did that never smack me across the face like a 2 by 4 But all the stuff you learn, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, you put that in doctrine, in your song, in your heart, in your mind, what's that going to produce? Thanksgiving. A thankful heart giving thanks unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know what to start with, to be thankful for, start with Colossians 1. God has made you meet, fitting, to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Filthy, rotten child of darkness that we all started with, now you're fitting. He's made us accepted in the Beloved. He's delivered us from the power of darkness, transformed us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Start there. And then keep moving out. Don't stay there. 
Now, like I said at the beginning, I know we've got some songy, songy people in here, musical people. That ain't me. I mentioned earlier that songs have the function to teach. Where would I get an idea like that? All of you, put your Bibles down and pick up a hymnal, please. Put your Bibles down, pick up one of these hymnals. Right on the cover. I'm making it easy. I'm not giving out commandments that are hard. I'm making it easy. You, know, you don't have to turn. The front of that hymnal, the cover, is quoting Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. How? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your thanksgiving, grace in your hearts to the Lord. The music is meant to teach. You may, I, I sometimes ask the kids before we start the service, why are we about to sing, kids? And i got to ban my kids from answering because they've heard it enough times. To teach us things. To admonish one another. If we're going to be wise, if we're going to be teaching and admonishing one another in truth, what does that say about our music? Not the style of music, the words. They have to be true. They have to be doctrinally correct as well. According to God's word, rightly divided, according to the revelation of the mystery given to Paul. That was a mouthful. Now, people have accused me many times of being too picky about music. Too picky. I would disagree. I think I'm just the right amount of picky. <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah, I'm picky. Just the right amount of picky. Here's why. Music is supposed to teach us. Music is supposed to admonish us. You all just said it. It's got to be in truth. So if I invited a guest speaker in here, got Brother Bob this week. Brother Bob stands up there and starts teaching everybody, hey, you're Israel. Your replacement Israel. Your salvation has to do with, you know, a little bit of what Christ did, but then you've got to finish the deal with your works. You're under a covenant with God. You'd all be looking at me like, what are you doing with this guy? Get him out of here. Well, guess what the majority of Christian songs and hymns teach? Your replacement is real. Salvation's not by grace alone through faith alone. It's your works. You're under a covenant. I'm the, just the right amount of picky. We have to be having our songs teach truth. Amen. Now, I'll tell you a quick story. And we still have plenty of time for discussion, so we're good. When we first started learning grace, the church I was at, you know, it was all of us discovering this. Well, we had already had, you know, the thick hymnals, talking like 450 songs and them things. So we're all learning grace, and we're having Bible studies, and we're talking about these things, and we're sorting this stuff out, and we're listening to messages, and pulling up stuff online, and, you know, we're just, there is something with this Paul thing. And we're starting to hash some things out, and okay, well, this is us, but this isn't. That over there is us, but this isn't, you know, and, it, we're, and then we're like, okay, that's great. All right, let's sing. Open the hymnal. la di da di da di da Whoa. We can't sing that. Let's skip verse 2 next time. Um, we'll just go 1 to 3. And then we sing the next song. Da, 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 da. I can't sing that either. 
Well, change those words and we'll replace those two words with this. And on and on and on. That's why that hymnal we have exists. It happened with other people too. Why did it happen? Because we cared more about truth than we cared about, well, that's the song was written and it was written 200 years ago and that guy's famous. I'm not going to change his words. We cared more about truth. We need to be teaching truth in the song as well as in the sermon. And that, I'll close with that. I want to challenge the musically people, the songy people in here. Because here's what I've learned the hard way about songy people and musical people. I've learned what we talked about at the very beginning. A song touches you, moves you in a way that speeches don't. So when you have a favorite song by a favorite artist, or a favorite verse of a favorite song by a favorite artist, and some jerk like me comes along and says, you need to change those four words, what happens? <laughs> Thou shalt not change my favorite song. This shall not stand. It's true. Some of you are smiling. You know it's true. I want to ask you something, though. What's more important? The way you've always sang the song? Or truth? Who wrote the song? A man wrote the song, right? Romans 3, 4, let God be true, and let that lying man who wrote the song be a liar. He got it wrong. He's a fallible man. Fix it. And I know, especially when you're first learning grace, and you're, well, I don't even know what to change. I don't know what's wrong. Ask somebody for help. Is there anything wrong with these lyrics? Oh, well, there's just that. Oh, I didn't even see that. Oh, look, now members one of another are serving each other and helping each other in the body. Didn't Jesus say in the red letters, those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth? So our songs need to be true. Our worship needs to be true. We'll close with this verse. And the point of our songs is not entertainment, whether entertaining us or entertaining God. The point of our songs, our psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is teaching us to understand who we are in Christ, what God's will is, and what we should do with our lives. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 15. This is for the people that say, well, you may be into that doctrine stuff, but I just like to sing. You ever heard that? You need to come to my, somebody was telling me about that, you need to come to my church. They're teaching the Bible in a way that you've never heard before, and it's really making things make sense and clear. Oh, I don't get into that stuff. I don't get into that, you know, understanding and wisdom stuff. I just like to sing and worship. Beep, beep, beep. Sorry, says Alex Trebek. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 15, and I'll be done. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. Are you allowed to be dumb as a brick in your songs? I will sing with the understanding also. Can't use that excuse. You like doctrine, I like to sing. Your singing should be right doctrine. Yeah, that's when you know you're going to a good show at a church. Not a singing, it's a singing. That's all I have. Anybody have any thoughts? Questions? Stories?